Uh, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the sixth biannual Sovereign Debt Management Forum of the World Bank. I appreciate that many of you have traveled a long distance to join us. I'm very disappointed that Hurricane Sunday played havoc with this important event. We wanted this forum to be memorable, but not quite so. But what matters most, of course, is that I hear everyone is safe and well. Still, it is not every day that debt management specialists from more than 75 countries and 10 international organizations convene in one place. And I'm glad to report that most of the invitees were indeed able to make it to Washington. We therefore decided to make the best of the situation and offer you at least one rich day for discussion. I thank you all for your understanding and I regret any inconvenience caused. When we hosted the forum in 2010, we hoped that by 2012, we could speak from a safe distance and with the benefit of hindsight of all the lessons learned from a crisis well past. Unfortunately, this is not the case quite yet. And perhaps fitting for a Halloween conference, we are still facing the ghosts of 2008 and we are still learning as we go along. What we have been reminded of is the importance of sound macro fundamentals, including fiscal space, which proved necessary, albeit not always sufficient, for resilience to crisis. As one would have expected, we have also seen considerable volatility in investor appetite in debt market caused by the crisis. More surprising, perhaps, might be the way this uncertainty played out in different markets. In spite of the many interconnections between economies, investors so far made clear bets on safe heavens, and we observed nominal yields not only near zero, but even in negative territory, as in Denmark or Germany. And in spite of expansionary policies by Fed, ECB, and Bank of Japan, we saw extremely expensive borrowing for a number of other countries, in particular in the Eurozone economies. As some of the latter continue to struggle, liquidity has flown to emerging markets, allowing even countries without a strong record in international bond markets, such as Sri Lanka or Zambia, to borrow at rates comparable or even lower than Spain or Italy. The more established emerging market economies also accessed international markets as historically low rates. We have seen Brazil issue a new 10-year benchmark bond in the global market at a yield of 2.6%. 2.6%. Mexico issue a 30-year bond with a spread of 170 basis points to U.S. Treasuries. And early this month, Poland issued a 10-year benchmark in the euro market at 3.3%. Given the uncertainties that we still face, this forum thus provides a unique opportunity for all of you to share insights on managing public debt, both for addressing immediate challenges and for building capacity for the future. I promise we will soon turn to the first plenary session on the continued relevance and possible need for adjustment of the bank fund guidelines on public debt management. But first, let me not fail to highlight the overall bank group's interest in sound debt management policies that make an important contribution to our mission to help eradicate poverty and boost shared prosperity. They do so not least by helping governments to build resilience to shocks and crises. As we have seen on too many occasions in the past, economic and financial crises can push many people back into poverty and set back development ambitions by numerous years. Finally, let me stress that the World Bank Group is available to partner with you to support capacity building in all areas of public debt and risk management and in financial sector development. Once again, I'm delighted to welcome and thank you for coming. I wish you all the success in your discussions today, 
and for the continued financial stewardship of your government's debts. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Philip the, and the panelists of the first uh, session, we want to come up while I finish uh, the housekeeping. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again. Uh, my name is Miguel Navarro. I'm the head of the Learning Outreach and Analysis Group here at uh, the Treasury. And uh, while my group, as uh, you have, many of you have heard from Amir over the weekend, is responsible for organizing this event, it is unfortunate we have no control over the weather. And we had to, as you have seen, revise the agenda several times over the weekend. Uh, but you have all received the latest agenda and uh, also your list of participants uh, who uh, decided and happily stayed in Washington despite of this event. Um, I would just like to let you know a little bit of the housekeeping items uh, here for the retreat. Uh, the first one is that we're going to have, as you've seen from the agenda, several breakout sessions. The breakout sessions, some of them are going to be held here in, the, uh, in this auditorium. The others are going to be in the MC2800, um, which you will be able to access through the doors on, on, this, uh, on what is your, your left-hand side, my right-hand side, through the Preston Lounge. Uh, these elevators will take you directly to the second floor, and in front of that floor, in, in front of the elevators, you will find the room. Uh, lunch is going to be served at 1 p.m., also right here at the Preston Lounge, and uh, we will have coffee breaks at 11.30 uh, approximately and at 4.30 p.m. Those are going to be served where you had your breakfast this morning, and those who are going to be in the breakout sessions uh, in the MC2800, uh, there's also going to be coffee for you there. Also, if you have noticed that this time we did not print any of the presentations, we're trying to uh, be conscious of uh, and be green, paperless. So uh, all of them will be uh, provided to you in a flash uh, drive uh, at the end of the day. And um, we will also uh, ask you that at the end of the day we'll distribute some evaluations. They're very, very important for us and we really would like you to fill those out. Um, these will really help us improve uh, what we are already doing and uh, include those uh, areas or, you know, that require a little bit of improvement. Uh, the restrooms are code checks. Restrooms are right here, also just outside of the auditorium. You know, you actually all found where the code check is by the, en by the entrance. And it's just remindful precisely for events like we have this weekend and others that may happen that the emergency exits, like the planes, remember that, you know, are, are located in this case to your right. Uh, and some of uh, also will be able to leave from the left in case of an emergency. We also have computers available for you outside of, of the Preston Auditorium and the uh, breakout room in case you want to use them. And um, most importantly, be mindful if there are, there's a line waiting for, to use them if uh, you can be quick uh, so that others can use it. Uh, you all came through security. Security was easy this morning through the main entrance. However, if you leave the building for any reason, you'll have to use the uh, visitor's entrance, which is located on 18th Street. Uh, they, they, that's what uh, the bank requires uh, for visitors. Finally, um, I would like to introduce Amira, which you all have heard from. She and all of our colleagues uh, who have been at the front uh, desk today will be available to guide you to the MC. <laughs> Let's just say that, yes, Amira deserves that and more. She actually spent most of the weekend and the storm uh, here trying to uh, make sure that the logistics for today were um, there. So uh, thank you, Amira, for, for that. Um, and last, I think the most fun part is that after we're all said and done with the retreat or sorry, the workshop today, we are going to have a cocktail reception for you. And this cocktail reception, again, where we had our, our breakfast and where we're going to have the coffee breaks. And we hope to see you all there. Uh, with that, I thank you for staying in D.C. despite the conditions for making it over here. And let me just pass on uh, the microphone to uh, Philip Anderson, who will introduce the first panel. Thank you. Thanks, Miguel. Well, it's now just over 10 years since the guidelines for public debt management uh, were published by the World Bank and the IMF. And we haven't really had an opportunity to, to formally review them or, or discuss them even though they uh, have found their way into many aspects of what we do. At the time the guidelines were developed, 
The objective was to assist policymakers in developing reforms uh, to strengthen the quality of public debt management and reduce their country's vulnerability to crises and financial shocks. They were requested by the International Monetary and Financial Committee and endorsed by the Financial Stability Forum, and as such, they were part of the set of initiatives to strengthen the international financial architecture at that time and in the wake of crises in the 1990s. And many of you will recall that the, the structure of public debt portfolios uh, played a role in, in precipitating or exacerbating a number of those uh, individual country events. So in other words, the, the environment in which we, we shaped the guidelines uh, had some similarities to what we have today. Different countries and difference in the nature of specific uh, crises, but some similarities. Uh, the guidelines, as the name suggests, were not intended as a set of binding practices um, or as mandatory standards or codes. Rather, they focused on principles that could be applied to a broad range of countries in different stages of development and with very different institutional arrangements. And that intent was reflected in the process to develop the guidelines themselves. Debt managers from around 30 countries uh, were consulted on early drafts. And at the time, I was running the New Zealand Debt Management Office and, and was one who contributed. And recall commenting on a, on a two-page outline uh, that the guidelines would cover. So it was very much a, a bottom-up kind of process. And a number of you uh, who are also involved here today. Before they were finalized, uh, 300 representatives from 122 countries um, attended five global conferences and all uh, expressed their views before the guidelines were finalized. So this broad-based consultative process resulted in a document that reflected practices that had arranged and emerged in a range of countries, but they hadn't been codified in one place. And also helped define what was universally acceptable and promoted some shifts in thinking about what debt management was all about. Um, a few of those stand out for me. One was a focus, a, a very specific focus on managing risk uh, rather than just funding the government. And I, I think this is reflected in the term debt management. Um, earlier that had been referred to as simply borrowing or resource mobilization. A second theme that runs through them is a focus on the importance of transparency and clear objectives. And to some extent, this drew on approaches that had emerged in the, the 1990s for fiscal and monetary policies, and which continue to this day. Finally, there are a number of insights drawn on sound operational management of high-value transactions, which is largely imported from the private sector. It's very much the same business, whether you're managing these types of transactions for a company, a bank, or a government. So reflecting on our own experience at the, the bank, the guidelines have been a useful touchstone uh, over the years for our work. Um, they provided a guidance to us as advisors and shaped how we've approached the implementation of capacity building programs. They've also shaped the tools that we've produced, such as the, the debt management performance assessment, the so-called DEMPA tool, which many of you will be familiar with, as well as the uh, medium-term debt management strategy tool. They've also influenced the financial products that uh, we as a, a bank provide to clients in order to help them more effectively manage uh, their debt and the risks they face. And you can even see uh, some of the themes from the guidelines appearing in the agenda of this conference. So the objective for this session is really to reflect on how the guidelines have, uh, have performed over the last decade relative to what was intended. Um, in particular, have they been useful through stable and volatile periods? And we really have seen everything uh, over this time from the, the great moderation to the great recession. Um, how useful are they as a source of gu practical guidance for policymakers and country officials? And how useful are they uh, for countries across the income spectrum? Now, to provide perspectives on these and other issues, I have a very experienced panel of practitioners. Uh, first, on, on my immediate left, Lars Horngren, who's chief economist at the Swedish National Debt Office, uh, where he's worked since 1996, and I, I believe Lars was involved in, in some of the early thinking on the guidelines. 
um, and so it's a great position to, to reflect uh, over the last decade. Um, after Lars, we have uh, Ottavio Ladero de Medeiros, who's head of public debt management strategic planning at the Brazil National Treasury. Ottavio's had 18 years' experience in public debt management in Brazil, so he's played a major role in, in building a, a world-class uh, debt management office there. After that, uh, we have uh, Sergei Storchak, who's the Deputy Minister of Finance for the Russian Federation, where his uh, portfolio of responsibilities includes, among other things, the management of public debt and assets. And he's been in this position since 2005, and, and before that uh, was the director responsible for uh, debt and, and assets. So uh, he's, he's also seen a lot in this area. And uh, at the very end, we have Mike Williams, who was uh, established the, the UK uh, Debt Management Office as its first CEO in 1998. And since leaving the DMO in, in 2003, Mike has worked as an independent consultant on debt management and cash management in many emerging market and developing countries. So he brings a, a very broad-ranging perspective um, on the applicability of the guidelines in, in a lot of different contexts. So with that, I will hand over to our, our first speaker, uh, Lars. Could we have Lars's presentation up, please? Better stand up so I can sure. throw away. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, Philip, and others that have invited me and given me this opportunity to comment on, on the IMF and World Bank, uh, World Bank guidelines. As Philip indicated, uh, I was partly involved in this and, and I, when they were, were first drafted, and I considered them in, an important document uh, at the time, and, and this has given me an opportunity to reread them for the first time in a couple of years anyway, and I think that they have stood the test of time quite well. Uh, and and uh, I still think that they give a very sound and balanced perspective on, on the key issues in, in sovereign debt management. And I also think uh, that, that in, in contrast to some other policy documents and policy areas that have been very much put under challenge in recent years, this document also considers things that have gone wrong in many countries in recent years. Uh, they mentioned the importance of, of uh, sound fiscal and monetary policy frameworks, resilience, contingent liabilities, not least to the financial sector. Uh, they talk about the risk of foreign currency debt, the importance of paying attention also to the debt position of the private sector, etc., etc. And of course, this reflects the fact that these guidelines were influenced by the experience from non-mature markets. Uh, many of us, uh, me included, didn't think that they would become relevant for us. But I think it's important to, when you talk about the guidelines that these issues, important though they are, they deal with the environment in which debt management operates, not debt management proper. Uh, and I also think another aspect that is emphasized in, 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 the, in the, the uh, guidelines is the importance of developing deep and liquid markets. Uh, and, and that also continues to be relevant. And as a European debt manager, I'm becoming more and more concerned that our current policymakers and regulators in particular are not very up to date on, on the importance of that. There are many reg regulatory legislative in initiatives in Europe that seems to go around quite the wrong way, making market making more difficult, for example, by, by short selling restrictions and very unbalanced transparency rules. And I don't want to get started on transaction taxes in, in, in that area. Uh, so, so, but of course, in, in this assessment, I'm not a neutral observer. I was there when they were drafted, and this, the, the debt office also commented, also provided a country study in the accompanying document, as I know some others uh, of, of you are here, were also involved in that project. But I will start to, to returning to the relevance on, of, of these, these issues for, for the debt office and the guidelines. It's common these days to use the complain or exp comply or explain framework when you write guidelines, and that's, very, that's not applied here, and, uh, and I think that's basically fortunate. But, but uh, if they were, that approach was implied, applied, we would not have much to explain because we largely play by, by, by this book. And, and uh, that's, of course, no coincidence because they were ba these guidelines are based on the principles that were already applied. In, in Sweden and many other OECD countries at the time. 
And so we have statutory objectives. We have transparent procedures for decisions on the debt portfolio. We have regular assessments going all the way up to the parliament. We have debt policy objectives and functions separated from other policy areas, in particular monetary policy. And we have all the other things that you should have according to the guidelines. And, and in a sense, you can somewhat pre uh, presumptuous, but you can see the, the debt office as a sort of a feasibility test of, of the guidelines. Can you actually run debt management on the basis of these principles? And I'd say the broad answer is yes. But, not least in this context, it's important to remember where Sweden came from in that regard. Thirty years ago, when I started as an economist, uh, actually the first chapter of, of my dissertation de dealt with regulatory monetary policy and how that affected the world. Thirty years ago, we had no regular bond market in Sweden. Only captive investors that hold, held bonds because they were forced to do so, and interest rates were set by a central bank as a monetary policy device. And debt management was only uh, an instrument of monetary policy, beyond the fact that you had to fund the debt, of course. And I, I think, so things can change, and it can change quite rapidly. And I only wish that we had had access to the guidelines in the 1980s and the 1990s. And I will hear how Brazil has, has used this uh, in, to, to great success. But of course, while, while, while playing with loading to the guidelines, there are some things that we do that others should not do, probably. And for example, we have a full separation between debt policy and monetary policy, an issue that we will come back to later in the later session today. And that wouldn't work in, in, in less developed markets and with other institutions. But I think separation is something to strive for. Debt policy, policy should be seen as a policy area in its own right, and that's a principle that, on which the guidelines are based, and I fully support that because it's only then that debt managers can be held accountable, and accountability uh, makes for, for better per performance. While we're working within the guidelines, there, are room there is room for improvement in the way we do things as well, of course, and we're dealing with that on an ongoing basis. We're struggling to improve contacts with, with investors, like you all do. We're thinking about evaluation, because you have the objective and you want to be able to tell uh, truthfully and, and honestly to your, your superiors in Parliament and, and your ultimate uh, uh, principles in, in the general population, that we are actually meeting this objective. We had a miss visit some years ago from the Standing Committee on Taxation from the Swedish Parliament, and the Chairman of the Parliament then asked me this specific question when I had presented this framework to him. Do you meet the objective? And I answered, only half in, uh, is a joke. Yeah, you said so. In your annual or biannual evaluation, you have said okay to the debt management decisions that we have taken. And, and that was partly a joke, but also something, uh, I said some serious basis to this, namely the fact that we do have a procedure where the Parliament is given the opportunity to express opinions on, on, on how debt, ma the debt is managed. They don't know whether it's actually we minimize cost with due regard to risk, and neither do we, but at least the, the transparency and the public nature of these, these, uh, this, this uh, process is very important, I think, in our context. And, uh, other things that we've been struggling with, we've been minimizing costs for any number of years, but we haven't had a consistent measure of cost. This year we actually think we do, based on accrued interest. And for the first time we think that we can compare nominal debt, inflation-linked debt, and foreign currency debt on a consistent manner. That analysis has led us to the conclusion that maybe foreign currency debt is more risky than we previously had felt. And now we have another issue in Sweden, which is the ultimate luxury problem among debt, manager, debt managers, namely what to do when the debt becomes too small to support liquid markets. And I have colleagues here, Uwe Stien Jensen is smiling. He did this a number of years ago, and his conclusions have proved useful, I, I, I think. But the question arises, should you issue more debt than, than required by your regular funding needs? And I know Australia, Denmark, and Norway, and others that have looked into this issue have said, have said yes. Right now, it's not an urgent issue because we're back in, in positive territory, that namely we have a net borrowing requirement again, but the government's ambition is, is to run a structural budget surplus and could come back to us. And that leads to certain questions, and, and these questions are, are so new questions, and these questions are made perhaps more pressing by, by new financial regulations because there are clear ambitions to introduce regulation that force banks and others to hold government debt. 
The Basel III regulations on liquidity requirements, for example, is, is one case in point. And of course, for some countries, oh, there is someone that, have to, that has to buy our bonds. That could be considered a relief. But for us, it's more a source of concern, and I think for other countries with small debts. And the question is, should that be a reason to change the, mo the, the, the objectives and tasks of, of debt managers? Should we do something else than minimize cost with due regard to risk? And, and, and approaching this as a trained economist, you'll have to think, I, I'd like to think anyway, in terms of, of is there a market failure here somewhere? Something, something that the market itself cannot organize and where government intervention is, is, is uh, justified on that basis. The need for liquid instruments for banks to hold is, would be one case. Lack of long -term, uh, safe long-term assets could be another. And I don't know, we are still thinking about these issues, but if you come to the conclusion that this is a proper role for debt managers to issue more than we actually need to fund our own our original debt, as it were, that could uh, justify the creation of some sort of debt-financed sovereign wealth fund. In that case, I think you should, you should move the management of, of, of those assets somewhere else than to the debt office, but that is a, 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 a subtle point in, in this context. But my, my preliminary, assessment, preliminary assessment anyway is that this is not an, a, a, a complementary task with a complementary objective and not a, a reason to change the, the general approach of, of the guidelines at most. This issue, I think it's mentioned in the footnote in the current guidelines, and that if you want to, it could m justify a section, but it's not a reason to redraft. And I, and I know the, the World Bank and the IMF are more concerned with, with other types of debt problems than the, the lack of, of government debt instruments, and justifiably so. I've also been asked to, to comment on, on the guidelines and the relevance to the debt crisis in the EU, and I do that very much as an outsider. Sweden is not a Euro country. We have actually come to effectively benefit from, from the EU crisis. We have a debt ratio around 30% and have been come, become to be perceived as a safe haven in this context. So these are very much an outsider's observations, and there are people in this room who know much more from the inside about this. But anyway, a few points on, on, the, re on the basis of in, on in relation to the guidelines. First of all, I say that the crisis is the crises, I should say, there are several, are not due to failure by debt management to follow the guidelines. There were policy mistakes, but they were in other areas. Uh, I don't think you, Ireland could have prepared my, by the use of debt management to, to, to take care of, of what happened to their public finances, for example. Clearly, the economies would have bet, benefited from tighter fiscal policies than, 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 than those that were actually implemented, but that's beyond the remit of debt management as commonly defined, and I think justifiably so. Also, it's important to note that in many cases, the problems are, in the euro area are due to over-indebted private sectors rather than, and current account imbalances within the euro area rather than, than, than uh, obvious failures of, of budget policies or debt policies. But again, we don't ask debt managers to look after the indebtedness of, of the private sector. Third, and possibly controversial, I think it has become clear that the euro is different. And, and from a debt management perspective, it, has, it is being a euro issuer and having euro, the euro as your own currency is a bit like issuing in foreign currency. And, and, uh, and I think our Irish and other colleagues are, are, are excused for not having realized that. And even if they had realized it, what should they have done about it? They, 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 they eliminated, eliminated their, their old domestic currency and this is what they got. I think you have to consider this a design flaw of, of the euro area that effectively no one saw, saw at the time. And, and, uh, and this brings me back to the guidelines again, and I quote, sound debt management policies are no panacea or substitute for sound fiscal and monetary management. If macroeconomic policy settings are poor, sound debt management may not itself prevent any crisis. And, of course, every debt manager would agree to that. But the key issue here is, can we come to a situation where the euro, as it's, it's now uh, functions, is comp compatible with sound fiscal and monetary management? 
And that, to me, is somewhat of an open question. I mean, the, it, the struggle goes to change that, to turn it into a sound fiscal and monetary uh, system is, is uh, going on as, as we speak. But, uh, and, and we dearly hope that the Euro countries can come to a positive answer to this question, but we're not quite there yet, I think. So uh, I, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Thank you, Lars. That's got us off to a, a very good start. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have all of the, the presentations first and then uh, open it up for discussion at the end. And I'll ask uh, Ottavio to, to take the floor. Well, uh, morning. Uh, my presentation uh, will try to show you what happened in Brazil along the last 10 years, uh, not for coincidence with the same time of the guidelines. We use this structure to try to compare with the document that is in your portfolio that resume the guidelines. The order is not the same, but the idea is quite uh, uh, the same. Uh, regarding, um, and moving directly to the presentation, um, institutional framework in Brazil, what we have been done since then. Um, I think maybe one of the most important messages that to have in Brazil, and it helped a lot to manage public debt there, and I think it's a, a point that's very relevant to the majority of the developing countries, emerging markets, is to uh, centralize the debt management in just a single unit, a debt management office, to guarantee that the objectives and guidelines are followed by the front office, by the, the issuer of the bonds, and are, are uh, targeted by the, all uh, debt managers, no matter back, mid, and front office, and all uh, officials of the government follow these uh, guidelines, these, these objectives and, and, and guidelines for public debt. In Brazil, um, Central Bank was prohibited to issue bonds from 2002 on the domestic market. And uh, the external debt management was centralized in the Treasury from 2005 on. So since then, the National Treasury became the single unit responsible for debt management in Brazil. Um, in 2003, uh, we created uh, a debt committee, a debt management committee, that meets once a year to define and approve the annual borrowing plan, uh, three times a year to revise it, and once a month to define the strategy of the bonds issues to the following month. Um, this is basically uh, the structure of our debt management office in Brazil, organized, as I said, in back, middle, and front office. It's important to just uh, highlight the point that our middle office, we create an investor relation unit responsible for dealing with uh, rating agencies, investors, press, and to guarantee that our um, speech is the same no matter uh, for which kind of uh, uh, group that is going the, the information. And we created also a macroeconomic scenarios unit responsible for uh, creating or discussing our own macroeconomic scenarios, not uh, aside from for the government official scenario. For us, it was very uh, important. Uh, beyond, of course, the risk management unit that's the core of our middle office. Uh, another important point regarding uh, 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 institutional structure is that uh, we approved 
uh, released our first code of conduct for debt managers in 2001. In 2005, it was um, uh, broadened to the whole uh, Brazilian National Treasury. Regarding transparency and accountability, uh, we publish uh, several documents um, since uh, 2001, the annual borrowing plan. We are in the um, 12th edition. This document publishes our objectives, guidelines, strategies, and targets for the end of the year. Uh, since 2003, 2004, the annual debt report, it is in its uh, ninth edition, which offers a retrospective analysis of the, for the annual borrowing plan, so uh, make it easier to compare if you reach it or not our targets. We have a monthly debt report, which presents information of our statistics on public debt, and it's easy to the press, to the investors, rating agencies to see how far we are of the target to the end of the year. Uh, a monthly issue schedule that we release every Friday before the following month to present all the auctions that are expected the following month. That newsletters and presentation for investors. All these documents are available in Portuguese and English in our website and the internet. Uh, as I mentioned, we created the uh, Institutional Relations Office that is a, a unit responsible uh, for dealing with rating agencies, understanding how they think, their particularities, the main indicators they use uh, to observe the countries, some, some uh, misunderstandings they have and try to all the time to discuss with them and change their perception about the country. This unit is also responsible to guarantee that uh, our speech is the same, no matter the, the kind of uh, uh, instrument or people that are being reached. Um, this institutional uh, relations office releases statements made by the government and arranges regular teleconference with investors. So it's a very uh, effective and efficient uh, group. Regarding accountability, um, we, we, we are audited internally uh, every year uh, by the Office of General Controller, an agency that's uh, from the uh, executive branch, and externally by the Federal Court of Accounts, the legislative branch. So we are audited by uh, internal and external institutions every year. Regarding the management objectives and coordination, uh, the objectives and guidelines for public debt management in Brazil are released every year in our annual borrowing plan. If you see the first one that is available in the internet, all, all the documents are there. So you can see that our objectives did not change at all since then. Our guidelines changed softly from the first document on. Regarding uh, the coordination with, uh, between public debt management and fiscal and monetary policies, as, as I mentioned, in 2000, the fiscal responsibility law was approved, prohibiting the central bank to issue bonds from 2002 on. For us, it was very important, on one side, to avoid competition uh, between bonds issued by central bank and national treasury, no matter if the term sometimes not the same, but the competition happens. And then this is what was very important to develop, not only to develop the market, the secondary market in Brazil, but also to guarantee that the objectives and guidelines are followed by the issuer of the bond. And there, there are the, the, the actors that are involved in that measurement are following the same objectives and guidelines and targets to the end of the year. Since 2005, as I mentioned, the external debt bonds was transferred from central bank to the treasury, and then we centralized it in the treasury, the whole debt management. Regarding strategy and risk, um, define the objectives and, and guidelines, so we start to think on 
uh, our optimum debt portfolio. So we choose among several possible debt portfolios an efficient frontier, uh, considering risks and costs for the whole public debt. After defining this optimum debt uh, portfolio, we um, discuss a strategy, a transition strategy, and after approve it, uh, we discuss and release the annual borrowing plan. Um, after the annual borrowing plan, we have a debt management committee, as I mentioned, that meets once a month to um, release the, the, the auctions to the following month. So basically, our benchmark uh, optimum debt composition is defined in July, August. Our uh, medium term strategy is September, October, and our annual borrowing plan is discussed and approved in November, December, and released in January every year. Um, this is just uh, a way to, to show how we discuss and, and analyze our optimum uh, composition of the debt for the medium to long term. We release since 2011, the first one, so it's the second year that we release our optimum debt composition. You use the same structure as you use to our annual borrowing plan, so to guarantee that the people can understand uh, well how far we are of our target. So we define in terms of composition, fixed rate, inflation linked floating rate and exchange rate bonds minimum and maximum uh, limits, and average maturity, lower and upper limits for them. Uh, probably in 2013, we will include the uh, amount of that outstanding in the short term as a, the sixth uh, uh, indicator. So we, we discuss the, the transition strategy. There is a bridge between short and long term, usually you take it for five years, and all the indicators are uh, evaluated along this time. And the third stage, the annual borrowing plan. As I mentioned, define objectives, guidelines, and targets to the end of the year. We present the document, uh, the main uh, table of the document is that, with uh, um, seven indicators, stock, profile, fixed floating inflation exchange rate bonds, and maturity structure, average maturity and amount of debt outstanding on the short term. So these are the limits that we present every year in our annual borrowing plan. As a last point regarding development and maintenance of an efficient uh, market, uh, in our annual borrowing plan, we release the frequency of auctions for the whole year to give an idea to the investors, to the analysts, what we intend to do with the main bonds, fixed rate, short and medium long term fixed rate bonds, floating rate bonds, and inflation linked bonds. So uh, the frequency of the auction, the kind of auctions that are used to, to happen. We also uh, define the, the maturities and benchmarks of the bonds, so defining uh, the materials for each kind of bond and uh, the frequency. So we can guarantee that uh, the bonds will outstand in several points along the year, will not concentrate in one specific month, and can guarantee liquidity on this point in time. We also release monthly, as I mentioned, every last Friday before the month of reference, our auction uh, calendar with uh, the day of the auction, the time, the type of the, the auction, security that will be issued, and the maturities expected. The amount is defined on the day of the auction. So uh, based on all these uh, uh, documents and, and, and and regular uh, procedures, uh, we increase the maturity of our fixed rate, the, our yield curve developed along the last years. Since uh, 2006, we increased to eight years, and since 2009 to 10 years, uh, the, the longer end of our fixed rate yield curve. The same for 
um, inflation-linked bonds, but their maturity is quite uh, uh, long. The longest one now is 40 years bond, paying 4.4% per year in real terms, compared to the first ones when we start to issue, close to 9%. So not only we could develop the yield curve, but uh, the macroeconomic scenario helped us a lot to lengthen the maturity of the debt. Uh, we also create a dealership system to guarantee the liquidity in the secondary market to, to help us to develop the, the, the secondary market, 12 financial institutions, being two independent broker firms. Every six months, we revise the, the league table. Uh, uh, basically, this uh, uh, resume our uh, 10 years, last 10 years, Based on, on the document, uh, I, can, I can anticipate that this document came in a very good uh, uh, moment. Part of this process was being already uh, developed, but it was very important to guarantee us and to make us be uh, more uh, uh, perception that we are in line with the best practices. And uh, I think. Uh, more than maybe revise the document, I think uh, compared to uh, uh, the experience I see in, in advanced countries, we have a lot of room uh, to advance before thinking on, on revising the documents, uh, this, this document. Thank you. Thank you, Otavio. That gave us a, a very good case study, in, in fact, of how some higher level principles guidance have been uh, operationalized in, in practice. Uh, now I'll turn to uh, Deputy Minister Stolchak. Well, uh, let me first of all join to my colleagues who already um, said that guidelines are valid, that are useful, that the guidelines help a lot to those in charge of debt management. Uh, Pro, but all this is true and correct from the perspective of debt managers, uh, debt managers as themselves. But what about investors? What about creditors? Do they share our views uh, that the guidelines are really good instrument in your decision-making process while you're studying boring? So this is a bit different judgment uh, from creditors' point of view. Mm. I took notice at least about two sets of guidelines when uh, people asking questions. Uh, first, section five of the guidelines you have uh, uh, with you the, the summary, which is describe the risk management. And uh, the, so uh, the second uh, part of the gui guidelines where lenders usually looking at and asking questions is the coordination and, with monetary and uh, fiscal policies. It's... Uh, uh, Sections one, uh, subsections 1.3, and uh, uh, my colleagues already had chance to mention this. The, the big issue uh, dealing with this linkage between debt management policy and fiscal policy and monetary policies. So uh, let me uh, put a couple of things uh, on on these uh, two issues. First. Risks. 
Judging from the debt situation in many, in number of developed nations, we can easily imagine that neither nothing can be done in field of risk management or debt managers used false approaches, false instruments in dealing with the issue. For example, debt management office, uh, offices can be absolutely perfect in terms of managing currency risk or interest rate risks. But what can, uh, what can these institutions do if they being asked to borrow and at the end they found themselves in the, situation, in the situation when they all borrowed. So we, we know that guidelines are not binding. It's principles and uh, sovereign borrowers are free to rely on them or do not rely on them. So from creditors' point of view, uh, this situation needs to be think about more carefully. Uh, in my position, I not only borrow, but uh, in a number of cases, I am lender while we, uh, we are managing our two so sovereign, sovereign funds. So we are buying debt securities of number of nations and of course we would prefer to be absolutely sure that uh, we would not lose our money. It's uh, money of taxpayers and uh, clearly each of us wants to be as accurate as and possible and uh, uh, feel ourselves as uh, safe as possible. So uh, we have clear evidence that the sections of the guidelines dealing with the risk management need to, need to be somehow uh, improved, resort. I, don't, I, I do not have clear answer to this, but my feelings is that uh, not, uh, we have some space uh, for further uh, uh, development of these uh, uh, sections of the guidelines. Second one, the general governance, the general macroeconomic policies and linkage between these general macroeconomic policies with the debt management policies. Uh, nowadays, we, in most nations, in my case as well, we have the situation when we can explain ourselves to policymakers present our positions and the views of uh, borrowing plans. But in case we are being strongly advised to borrow and uh, we do not feel it is uh, safely, we'll have to borrow. It's uh, the rule of the games. Uh, so uh, is, is it, do we have any chance to shift the authorities within our jurisdictions in order to have a situation when debt managers can say d clearly no. It is, it is not the case. And if you, in the, during the election campaign, promised a bit too much, you should think about changing your views and keep to the debt management uh, uh, strategies as debt managers advise. So, uh, from this point of view, of course, we, uh, we need to think about the possibility to uh, rely on the guidelines uh, as an instrument um, to defend our positions. So it means uh, we need uh, something to be done uh, to have the guidelines as more politically binding document uh, in terms of, for example, Article 4 IMF consultations, like, like this. So um, it is uh, not uh, so clear for me 
uh, how it can be done in terms of uh, multilateral discussions, but the feeling is that it's absolutely necessary. So, but uh, what about other uh, parts of the guidelines in Russian experience? Uh, I would like to give a number of examples that we were clearly in lines with these guidelines. Just a strange combination of words, but it's true. Uh, first, and maybe the most important, uh, which we picked up from this um, well work done by IMF and the World Bank, is the necessity to have clear uh, debt management strategy. I remember when, when we tried to prepare the first document of this kind exactly 10 years ago and how it was difficult uh, for those involved in the job. It was never done before in my country, so uh, it took us probably one year and a half to, to prepare debt management strategy report uh, for, the, for, the, for ourselves and for the government. Nowadays, my government got used to it, uh, to, to such kind of um, uh, policy paper, and, we, and when we a bit late, or hesitating with uh, uh, right time presentation of the document, we've been strongly, uh, strongly advised to be quick and do, do the job. From this point of view, guidelines are absolutely uh, useful things to rely on. Then, institutional uh, framework, it's section three. So once again, uh, after uh, some um, period of hesitation, we uh, concentrated uh, uh, the whole debt management in one single department. Russia still d do not have uh, does not have a debt management office as independent office. But uh, we are now approaching uh, this stage of development and uh, a final decision of setting up Russian financial manager uh, agency. Uh, uh, these decisions were uh, affected by the government. Now uh, documents are being passed to the uh, state parliament for final consideration. And I'd like to say that uh, uh, just for my Swedish colleagues, we are trying to uh, be a bit provo pro provocative, setting up in one single agency both debt management and sovereign files, uh, funds management. So, please <laughs> uh, uh, send us good <laughs> signals that we, we can succeed finally. But uh, of course, we understand that it's quite quite uh, unusual approach. But and theoretically, asset and liability management can be kept in one single uh, place. So, and uh, maybe uh, just briefly uh, about the last section about guidelines dealing with the uh, development of primary and secondary market or, or in uh, each ju ju jurisdictions. It happened so in my country that we failed to comply with this for quite a long period of time. Only recently, uh, last three years, we paid big attention to this uh, uh, section of the guidelines. It, and uh, frankly speak, uh, speaking, uh, something needs to be done to show that it is as important, I mean the secondary market development, this is, is as important as important the uh, governance or institution for framework for the debt management. So, uh, uh, just to conclude, we uh, in Russia uh, consider uh, the guidelines very useful. First, we, second, we consider that we, all people involved in debt management, uh, have. A, accumulated some experience during the last uh, 10 years, and we can mm, make uh, some conclusions. Maybe uh, some part of guidelines can, uh, can be written, uh, can be resought, and uh, we, uh, I, I'm 
IMF and World Bank will uh, lead the, this job and prepare second edition or uh, second uh, um, version of the guidelines. Why not? Uh, Russia, as the coming G20 presidency, now working on uh, our agenda, uh, on, on our coming um, agenda for the next year. That issue is within our um, within our, uh, our priorities. Uh, it would be a bit strange not to start discussing debt management or debt sustainability issues. In, in the situation when uh, the uh, words linked to debt crisis are for months on the front pages of almost uh, any uh, newspaper or almost on each side uh, of uh, different institutions. So uh, now we are preparing ourselves and st start working with the uh, colleagues in, in G20 about uh, dimensions of debt discussions within G20. I hope that this discussion will stimulate uh, not only discussions, but find right approaches to, to borrowing strategies. We, uh, what happened in our days? People discuss a lot the issue of debt restructuring debt crisis, uh, crisis uh, prevention and so on. But I think uh, the, whatever the outcomes of discussions about voluntary restructuring or statutory restructuring mechanism could be, the uh, cornerstone of all this job is the beginning. Debt borrowing uh, planning and debt borrowing implementations. So it, it, for me it means whether you follow the uh, analysis and uh, advice set up in the, guideline, uh, in, in the guidelines or you do not follow it. Thank you. Thank you, Sergei. That's brought um, uh, a new focus on the guidelines, thinking about it from the point of view of, of creditors uh, and what they would like to see, uh, which brings you into the territory of how the guidelines could, uh, could have more teeth, uh, if you like, uh, which would provide assurances uh, to creditors that debt is, is well managed, as well as the, the possibility of uh, reviewing them within the, in the context of ongoing work within the, the G20. Let's, uh, let's move on to, to Mike now. Thanks, Philip. Um, well, good morning, everyone, and I'm very pleased we all managed to be here. Um, I'm going to give inevitably a rather impressionistic, a very wide-ranging uh, perspective uh, on the guidelines. I'm going to make a number of assertions. Uh, perhaps, fortunately, the shortage of time absolves me from justifying those assertions. Um, but I hope to uh, cover the ground based on the experience of, uh, a, of a large number of uh, countries. So, to start with, some initial assertions about the guidelines. Uh, I think they have been very useful uh, in creating a set of common objectives, uh, a shared language that we can all talk, that we can all uh, relate to. But many users of the guidelines, particularly perhaps in uh, lower income countries, but uh, in a number of others as well, have found them rather confusing in practice. Uh, they haven't really bitten uh, effectively in a number of countries where there is essentially a very different uh, approach uh, to governance. Uh, and I think in practice, in some areas, they've been overtaken first by Graham Wheeler's book and, and subsequently by the uh, MTDS guidance 
uh, and the DEMPA guidance. Um, what I want to do now, though, is just go through them very uh, quickly, trying to produce, uh, uh, pulling some of the issues apart and trying to say what the main uh, successes and, if you like, and continuing challenges are. And I want to do that in relation to the six building blocks that we're all familiar with and have already been uh, mentioned today, uh, which are about objectives, transparency, the institutional framework, uh, debt management strategy, the risk management framework, and developing the government security markets. And that's the sort of structure that the guidelines has created. And just to go through these uh, building blocks uh, very, uh, very briefly. Uh, objectives. The guidelines have given us much greater clarity about objectives in policies, uh, ensuring attention is given to the whole debt portfolio, uh, reminding us about uh, market development. Uh, we all know now the words uh, medium to long term and prudent degree of, uh, a prudent degree of risk. They're all embedded uh, in uh, international thinking, uh, and that's been very important. On the other hand, I think the guidelines are confusing in some ways. They're called public debt management guidelines, but in fact, most of the content is about central government debt, not about uh, public sector debt. And it was, wasn't until the MTDS guidelines that that was uh, perhaps clarified a bit more fully. Despite the amendment of the guidelines in 2003, there is still a lot of confusion, particularly perhaps again in uh, LICs, uh, about the difference between debt management and debt sustainability. Of course, debt managers know what the difference is, but as soon as you widen uh, the frame of reference uh, and involve other commentators, uh, there is confusion. And we've seen that uh, indeed in much of the discussion uh, in relation to the uh, Eurozone. Transparency, uh, are some big benefits, there's much greater openness about policies, uh, basic data is uh, widely published, uh, and everybody is conscious uh, of the need for a certain amount of branding, uh, and of course Brazil is a, a, a leader in that, in that field. However, where countries have, don't have a, a culture or an experience of transparency, there is still a huge amount of resistance, and it is, it's quite surprising sometimes about the data that they are not prepared uh, to release. And I think generally there's been much less progress uh, in relation to uh, accountability. Uh, external audit is often very weak. They don't understand uh, securities markets uh, and they don't understand the nature of uh, debt management objectives. Um, parliaments, congresses are often more concerned with debt sustainability and fiscal responsibility uh, issues. Uh, and of course, uh, wider commentators uh, lack sometimes the skills to talk effectively about risk. And debt managers get criticized because everybody benefits from uh, hindsight. Institutional framework, huge advances in relation to the legal framework in many countries, perhaps particularly in the transition countries, who in some sense were starting uh, with a clean slate. Uh, front, middle, back office concept, very widely established. That's part of, the, uh, part of the shared language. And indeed, I think the institutional framework uh, is a very widely quoted section of the guidelines. But there have been problems. There have been problems in setting up debt, some debt, uh, semi-autonomous debt offices, where there have been principal agent problems when the Ministry of Finance itself hasn't retained sufficient uh, capability. Uh, integration hasn't in practice always worked terribly well. Some of that is just straightforward resistance, turf wars, silos, local baronies, uh, call it what you will. Uh, the execution and management of loans and credits requires different skills uh, and different management input from that relating to securities. Uh, and treasury functions have often resisted the implications uh, of integration. 
and you know, we've had experience of some countries that have effectively got two front offices, uh, which I think is very damaging in relation to the, uh, how you present to the market. The separation between policy and execution has also been very patchy. I mean, ministers just like making these decisions. Uh, and of course, there are staff, uh, there are staff issues. <clears throat> On the strategy side, as already been said, the development of a debt management strategy is at the heart of modern debt management. Uh, and that's been a great success of the guidelines. And it's also introduced the concept of uh, asset liability management and thinking about the whole of the government balance sheet, uh, which has been developed subsequently. However, they didn't of themselves help give much help as to how to develop a strategy. There's some confusion because the cost risk trade off discussion comes under risk management, not under debt management uh, strategy. Uh, it's far too complicated in countries where there is a shortage of data and uh, skills. Um, and uh, of course, that led later to the uh, very proper emphasis that developing your strategy doesn't necessarily require quantitative analysis. Uh, the other point that I think, from my own experience, the guidelines are very weak on cash management and how that is best integrated with debt management. Risk management framework, again, good on some of the details, the emphasis on contingent liabilities, uh, which we learned from the uh, East Asian crisis uh, had been uh, often overlooked in the past importance of stress tests, and also identi identifying some of the risks associated with active portfolio management. Again, some confusions, uh, also a confusion about strategy and target benchmarks, and that because it reflected controversies that were in developed countries uh, at the time. And there is not much of a distinction between uh, thinking about risk at a high level, high policy level, and actually managing risk uh, and controlling risk uh, on a day to day uh, basis. Um, and again, there has been in many countries uh, an insufficient awareness of operational risk uh, issues. Security markets, I've already uh, said, was a, a main, uh, an important output of the guidelines focusing on the development of domestic security markets, but of course it remains a challenge and we're going to hear more about that uh, later today. Progress has been uh, disappointing. Uh, I think it's also been confused. Sometimes IFIs give confusing messages uh, to lower income countries about the importance of looking for external debt with concessionality. Uh, and, of course, uh, investment bankers with their offers of lunch and so on seduce people into issuing uh, externally whatever the debt management strategy says. So that's just a brief sort of balance sheet in relation to the building blocks. Uh, and just to sort of bring it to a close, a few uh, cross-country thoughts. Um, I think the guidelines have been very useful. And we heard Sweden, Brazilian cases in particular where there are a sort of cross-check, a benchmarking for uh, countries who uh, have the capability to uh, build from them. Uh, they've been hugely beneficial in transition countries who are starting many of these processes afresh, but less good where there's an inflexible legislative environment, uh, an unwillingness from the top maybe to uh, embrace uh, the concepts, break habits, difficult to implement where there are thin administrative structures uh, and they don't really bite on concerns of lower income countries who are more focused on uh, loans uh, and credits. So having started with some assertions, uh, just a few uh, final ones. Um, I think they've, the guidelines have been great in bringing a, a very important focus on strategy, professionalism, portfolio risk. Uh, and they arguably contributed to the relative resilience of many middle income countries in particular during the uh, financial crisis. And that's a huge uh, benefit. But although we've changed the language, uh, we now have to look forward to a number of different challenges. 
uh, which will need different approaches. I mean, I've listed a few here, market development, strategy in a constrained environment, governance, reform plans, cash management, operational risk. Uh, you may want to add the interaction uh, with banking sector exposures, subnational debt. You will have your own list. Uh, but that's all for the future. Uh, and for now, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Oh, we've now had uh, four very good presentations touching on, on many angles um, of the guidelines, uh, how they've worked, um, and where some future work could lie. Now I'd like to, to turn it over to, to you for, um, I think we've got time for one round of questions and comments. I'd like to, to wrap up at 25 past the hour so that you have time to move on to the, the breakout sessions for, for 10.30. Floor's open. Yes, uh, Jose. Thank you. Um, my name is Jose Oyola. I, um, I'm going to give the perspective of the auditors <coughs> in the guidelines. The guidelines were very, very useful to the Supreme Audit institutions, which were searching for criteria to be able to judge the performance of debt management operations. At the time, there were many different inconsistent um, recommendations about how to go about judging the effectiveness, the efficiency, and the economy of debt management. And the guidelines proved to be the model that many Supreme Audit institutions are using and are incorporating into the accounting and the auditing framework. So the guidelines have been a huge success in terms of the ability of auditors to try to understand better what should be looked at and how should debt managers be assessed. <laughs> Having said that, um, the guidelines do need to improve over time in order to keep their relevancy. And um, some of the issues that we have found, the auditors have found, when looking at debt management operations is that debt managers have to be sometimes cajoled out of their comfort zone. When they only look at, the, at their task as managing the debt structure and not managing the variance of the cash flows that affect the debt structure. And this is indirectly measure, uh, mentioned in the guidelines. And is, this goes to the point mentioned by Mike <coughs> Williams. Debt managers <coughs> are seeing that their challenge is not to only manage the structure of existing debt, but rather looking at the cash flows that affect the debt structure. And so you have to be able to increase your ability to manage cash along with your ability to manage debt so that you can do a better job. And this is unavoidable in the cases like Russia where they already have been entrusted with the management of an asset, of cash. So the guidelines need to be modified, expanded, to accommodate that reality that now debt managers in many countries have to manage the buffers, the asset buffers, and take an asset liability perspective. And once they do that, then they will be able to become more relevant and become more effective in doing their job as debt managers. Thank you. Thank you for that, that comment, Jose. Any others? Yes, we have uh, one on the back. Uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Walton Gilpin. I'm from the Comoa Secretariat. I must also say that the guidelines have been quite useful in augmenting our capacity building efforts in our client countries. And as 
debt management evolves over time, we also have seen the need for the guidelines also to be slightly evolving with debt management. One area I would like to bring out is the need for the debt management systems to be integrated within the overall information management system framework in countries. If the guidelines can touch on this aspect, because as the previous speaker said, it would augment cash management, it would also help the debt managers to have timely data to support the debt policies and the debt strategies, and it will also give a semblance of a seamless data flow within the overall public um, um, financial management system. Secondly, the first uh, speaker mentioned um, aspects that the debt manager has no control over, like the current accounting balance or discussions in heavy um, debt burdens in the private sector. Uh, this definitely is not the debt manager's um, uh, mandate or purview. However, probably the guidelines could mention that if there are discussions in specific areas, namely the current account balance, private sector debt, etc., etc., this could impact the um, overall um, ability to manage your debt. There is um, the guideline, I think it was point three, that was put up earlier on the screen that did indicate in a more generalistic you know, manner that um, other aspects of the economy could distort you know, the debt manager's ability to effectively manage the debts. You know, so what I was thinking is maybe zooming in on critical areas um, to give the debt manager a bit more clarity as to how his poor view could probably be um, impacted you know, by specific areas in the overall macroeconomy. Thank you. Thanks for that comment. I think we've got time for, for one more before I wrap up. Anyone got any burning points I want to make? Okay, well let's, uh, let's leave it there. Um, I think we've had a, we've had a, a broad-ranging discussion and I, my personal perspective uh, from the discussion is that by and large the, the guidelines have, have stood the test of time and have provided useful guidance. They're sufficiently broad in terms of the, the areas they need to take account of. Uh, and we've heard some, some detailed accounts how countries have taken these higher level principles and turned them into debt management practices in their own countries. Uh, we heard that uh, uh, suggestions that perhaps the, the guidelines could have more teeth, uh, be more binding. Um, right now, they, they represent guidance only. They're not part of formal surveillance, for example, uh, by the, the IMF. Um, so that, that might be one prospect in the future. Um, after a period of time, with the guidelines having been demonstrated to, to broadly work, maybe there would be an appetite for that. We've had a number of suggestions as to how the guidelines could be modified. Uh, for example, they're tougher to apply in some weaker institutional environments. Um, as is debt market development. And we've also had some specific suggestions in terms of strengthening the, the linkages between public debt management uh, and public financial management more broadly. I'm not going to um, commit today to, to revise the guidelines. Um, they were originally commissioned by, the, uh, by governors of the um, IMF and the World Bank, and we haven't been asked to revise them at this point. Um, and it's not a light task to create the same sort of broad-ranging uh, consensual process. Uh, it does take quite a lot of effort. But I think from this discussion, um, we've got a number of pointers as, as to how they should be revised, so I think that is something that definitely uh, should be kept on the agenda. We haven't heard from a lot of you on this topic. Um, you haven't had a chance to participate in this discussion, but would very much like to hear from you. So whether that's in, in the margins of our conference today or whether you want to, to write to us about your views 
on the guidelines in the future. We'd be very happy to hear from you. So with that, I'd like to close the session, um, thank our speakers who um, provided some excellent insights, and uh, move on to the next session.